Bobbish. Okay, let's continue. We have here uh, now Darai and Heinz from Tremor. Hello. And they are going to confess some rusty sins. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about how to escape from the police in a rusty car. Um, nearly, not exactly. And we are talking about criminally fast rust, because rust is fast, but if you are willing to break a few rules, it can be even faster. Um, our agenda is simple. We'll start with an introduction. Welcome to the introduction. And we'll present our use case, because when we talk about performance, it really matters about <coughs> why we care about performance. You often don't, so that would be a non-use case. We actually do have one. And we'll introduce, introduce some tricks on how to make a Rust program faster. They are applicable to other things, um, so you can take something away from this even if it's not Rust, in most cases at least. Um, we'll present what the result of all this thing was. And at the end, we'll talk about performance not on a code level, but more on an architectural level, on how you can get gains out of thinking ahead and not just writing code. So um, we like to do that. We give you a bit of list of takeaways, what we hope you come out of this talk, so you can prepare when to listen, when to just ignore us, which is perfectly well, by the way. Um, <clears throat> we want to teach you a few patterns um, that you can use generally to make programs more performant with a focus on Rust. Um, some specific tricks to the application we use, which are more architectural than code-wise, um, an understanding of why we build what we build and how we build it, and most importantly, we hope you all have fun for the next 40 minutes while we make it as our loss. Doug, over to you. And breathe. <laughs> Okay, so our production use case is fairly uh, simple. We process over 11 terabytes of logs and metrics per day. Um, we use a scary amount of infrastructure to do this, and over the past 18 months, our engineering organization, all 2,500 of them, um, have decided that data centers weren't good enough. They also wanted the cloud. So we now have a hybrid situation of traditional data center software and services migrating towards the cloud and all of the integration points and problems that you have sitting in the middle. Um, Heinz and I decided that that wasn't crazy enough. Uh, we should also sub-optimize the costs as this was happening in the background. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So with a little bit of rust and a few performance tricks and understanding of the domain, so logging and metrics, so a lot of data transformation, a lot of enrichment of data, a lot of normalization and cleansing, um, we set about to fix the problem by reducing our footprint in our data centers and in the cloud by 10x. Um, and we did that. Um, so we just kept on developing and didn't tell anyone we got the 10x until we open sourced it on Saturday. Yes. So it's all open source. You can download it and make your data centers faster. Don't tell your bosses how you did that. Save that to later until it's really successful and they'll pay you more, you get promoted. Everyone wins. <laughs> now we're going to tell you how we did it. What were you using before? Um, before, uh, we were using um, open source Java based products that we don't want to name because we don't want to name them in a bad way. Oh, but we will tell you after the talk. <laughs> so, let's go to the rusty performance tricks. You will notice we have the crap every now and then that is obligatory, otherwise, we get kicked out of the Rust community. Um, it's called Ferris. God knows why. Um, but we start with a disclaimer. Um, we will show some code here, and that code will be horribly pathetic. Um, so please bear with that. Um, it has to be, it has to fit on a slide and in a 40 and not 400 minute talk. Um, it is, as Dara pointed out, open source. So if you want to see this in action, go to the repository and dig through it. Um, since some of that will be complex, Feel free to ask questions, but if it is a longer discussion, wait until the end or wait until we are outside, we are around all day to ask questions if you have some. Um, just to not hold up the entire thing for people who are curious about it. Um, so let's start. Um, Tremor has, not Tremor, Rust has the tendency to be very picky on type checking and what they call borrow checking. So you can borrow something in two ways, mutably and immutably. Um, so the immutable one, you can do a lot of stuff with because it knows that will never change. The mutable button, one, Rust goes, hey, red flag, something goes wrong, because it might relocate the memory and invalidate other references or other borrows of the same data structure. 
Now, if you know your data structures, we come to the example, you can take some of that and say, well, yes, we borrow it as immutable, and then we use the slash hammer, which is called memtransmute in Rust, and just make it mutable. Um, and <coughs> there's a danger to that, and we have been in this place and had a few sec faults because of it. Um, oh, not in production, only, only, only in development. Um, if you are wrong about your assumption that something doesn't relocate the memory, then you get end up with pointers pointing to stuff that doesn't exist anymore, and that is bad. Let's let's look at an example. <clears throat> Here we have a hash map, general object hash map collection key value, whatever you want to call it, and we insert two things into it: a string A called Badger and a string B called Snot. <clears throat> now we want to take the string B and append what string A is into string B. So ideally, what we have to do is we borrow A and then borrow B mutable and concatenate it. Rust will go, no, you can't do that. You borrowed A, so you can't borrow B mutable. That's fair. Well, that's fair. That's fair. Well, so we go, okay, we don't borrow A. We take A, we make a copy. Now it's safe. Rust says, yes, you can. And then we concatenate it to B. Wonderful. Um, downside is we now have cloned an object, um, which means memory allocation, all the fun things that make it slow. Um, so how to solve it is the sledgehammer. You can see the first three lines are the same, and then we enter a unsafe block, which is pretty much Rust's equivalent of saying, here be dragons. Mm -hmm. um, and in this unsafe block, we again borrow A, and we borrow B, and you can see the difference here. Um, here it says borrow mute, and, uh, sorry, get mute, and here it just says get. Um, and around that, we put the transmute function, which is the Rust sledgehammer, um, and tell it, please make that immutable reference to a string no longer a string. Now we can push at zero extra cost. And since we happen to know that hash maps by just depending to a object in the hash map won't change the memory layout of the hash map itself, perfectly safe. Um, and one of the really nice benefits is you'll notice we haven't used the unsafe keyword, so this is all perfectly safe. If you ignore the line of unsafe. If you ignore the unsafe line. Yes. And the <laughs> mutable transmutes, which Rust will not even allow you otherwise. Um, so what does this do? If you see, this is a violent plot of running this bent drug mini example that also is on Git, so if you want to run them yourself, you can. Um, and we see the original clone one is here at 600 nanoseconds, and the one with the crap on it, um, which is happy by the way, goes, hey! And um, as fast, there was 500 nanoseconds on average. Average is lie, but if you look at the plot, the rest is faster too. So if you do another 300 of these fixes on your critical path, that adds up to be quite a performance difference in aggregate. And that's really what this is all about. It's not about this one pattern or change, it's about finding those patterns in your code and applying it to the hundreds of instances where similar patterns might materialize and might um, impact the performance of your system. If you're in a real-time world with a real-time critical system, find these patterns, document them, share them with everyone else on Twitter, um, <laughs> and we'll also use them, um, yes. and everyone Yes, can. please make our code faster. We need it. Um, Example two, and you will see that all the examples follow the same pattern. You will have the nice graph at the end as well. Um, relocation churn. So uh, I assume everyone or most people know about collections, which are just data things which collect other data, and that usually they are implemented in a way that they have a algorithm for allocation, which armatizes allocation over time if you keep growing them to virtually no allocation. That is awesome if you have a long-lived data type, if you have a short-lived one, like we are doing event processing. So we get data, do something with it, and then get rid of it. So we kind of don't have long-lived data. Um, this armatization doesn't work because there's nothing to armatize over. Um, <coughs> simple solution to that is just assume you get a lot of data and allocate all the, time, uh, uh, all the data in the beginning. Perfectly safe, by the way. Nothing can go wrong other than you run out of memory. Um, that's something to judge for yourself. If you can afford the memory, it's really fast. If you can't afford the memory, uh, well, you'll run out of memory and then you go into swap and then it's really, really slow. Um, so, here an example, we create a new vector, which is a global array, um, and we have a loop that may continue or not 
for a few times, and every time it continues, it puts snot into the vector. It's a snot vector. Um, and this is slow because, well, for one, it allocates with number zero. Um, then we put the first snot in, so it has now to increase it to one, put the data in, then we put snot in again, and now it's two, so it has to make a new vector, copy the data, append, and so on. Can anyone think how we make this faster in another language? Shout it out. Pre-allocate. Pre-allocate. Yes, basically, here we do with 512. Um, that is a magic number. We rolled a die with 512 sites and it came out as 512. Mm -hmm. um, and if most of the time maybe continue ends prior to 512 invocations, you're golden, no extra allocations. If it goes over, at least it grows into bigger chunks. So you can pick something close to where you expect it to be. We like 512. What is the difference here? Let's look at the graphs again. Happy Ferris crap on the left side. 12-ish. Yeah, it's about 12 and a half versus 15. Um, so again, a nice little performance increase on that one. Because we don't have to reallocate. Awesome. Again, add this to the first one, and it grows bigger and bigger. But Next the, example. Sorry, yes. You mentioned in the bad example that you copy the vector on every write. So Rust just literally allocates enough to put the stuff in, so it don't, won't grow like by a factor of two every time you increase the size of the vector. I mean, typically, some array libraries will the, it not increase by numbers of one, but it it, it doubles, yeah, doubles. Just until the example of two doubling means adding oh, one. Um, if we would have gone after two, it would have been four, then eight, then sixteen, and so on. Um, but until two, it is by one and doubling, both. Um, but yes, it does that. It grows. It amortizes by that. Uh, but if you create a new vector every time, it kind of can't amortize. Also, the allocator might not need to reallocate because it has some free space after it, but you can't know that, assume the worst case. And if that's a transient collection, then you're taking the hit every time you're creating a transient collection, so it becomes catastrophic. And in our case, we process a lot of JSON. It's typically catastrophic. Um. Yes. JSON is pretty catastrophic. Um, bias for pre-calculated data. So. Um, this touches on the uh, fact that we have written an interpreter and a language for this. Um, and <coughs> a lot of the script have keywords, for example, that happen, or variable names, that are common because people like to call the variables i, and a and b, and c and d and e, and so on, because no one likes to write long variable names. Um, so instead of having to go through the process of making new holders for those variables, since we know that most of the time exist, we can pre-calculate the data for those variables and, hey, don't have to do computation. An uh, example in Rust is that they have the cow class, which has nothing to do with cows, even so I would like it to, um, but makes me giggle every time, which is great while I like using it. Um, and <coughs> that's basically a copy on write, not a cow, not moo. Um, and that has a, a borrowed and owned variant. And the board variant does save on allocation of the underlying data if you can just borrow it. Um, so example here is we have a function that is a user input, like please type in your name, um, and then we create a string from it to do something with it later. Um, now with names, we would know a number of names that exist or number of words that exist, so we could pre-populate that. Um, any suggestions how to how we are going to make this faster? Yes. Um, we use a function, which not takes takes a still the borrowed one from the user input, um, and tries to create a copy and write data structure of it. And we have well known words which happen to be well known, um, and if those well known words appear we just can return a borrowed cow of the string that we already have. That string is now part of the binary, so no allocation, no nothing happening here. Rust is pretty smart. It will actually inline that all the way. There is no object creation here or anything. Um, so, what's the difference? Well, that is slightly significant. Also, please note those graphs are not zeroed. 
Um, so not this is zero and that is 700. This is about 650 and that is 700. It's still a nice improvement. Also, the, also in the also. Um, in the lower result here, you'll see there's a double um, bump. That's an artifact of the test being really written quickly and not perfect, but we needed it to be good enough to fool Rust um, into giving us some numbers because it gets optimized yeah. out to the point that we can't actually show <laughs> the difference. <laughs> so the double yes, peak is our we attempt. Had, to we had a random test. function in the test that generates a known keyword one third of the time. If you look at the bumps, that's approximately well-known time, not well-known time. Um, so a standard uh, danger with micro-benchmarking is the data is probably lying to you. Triple check it, then phone a friend, then ask the audience, then go to a conference, then you'll find out what you did wrong. Yes. Someone here knows what we did wrong with that benchmark and how we measured it, and we'll learn something from yes. that. Com please file complaints to the email address. Or just here. send it to Twitter and we'll read it. <laughs> so um, Rust is big about checking. So going back to collections from the beginning, um, if you access an element in the collection, remember the get, it will check if it actually exists. Same for get mute. It will make sure that you do not write to memory somewhere that isn't part of this collection, which is awesome because we kind of don't want the program to do that. Um, but it also is slow. Because every time you read or write an element of a collection, um, it starts to go, oh, is this collection long enough? If yes, return something. If no, rise an error. Um, which time and time again does fill up. Um, and this is one which actually holds a danger again, because if you try to circumvent this, you could end up accessing memory that doesn't belong to the collection. And that means either getting sec fault because you try to write somewhere where you're not supposed to write, in the good case, or corrupting data that is really surprising during runtime in the worst case. So <coughs> let's look at an example. Um, again, super synthetic. Um, and we create a vector with three elements, one, four, and three. And the observant of you might have noticed that it's four and not two. Um, so we fix that mistake and set value second one in this, so index one, the four, two, two, so it's nice, one, two, and three. Um, we do that by get mute, which remember from the first collection, which is slow, well not slow, which might not be allowed, um, and check if that is some, that's the same option type that was discussed this morning, sum and none. Um, so is something at place one, and if there is something at place one in this collection, we assign it a two. Now, that means there are at least two conditionals in here now in the code when you compile it, and exception handling, so yeah, slow. We ha since this vector is statically sized with three elements, we know that we can always access number two. So Rust offers the nice and convenient function get unchecked and got unchecked mute, which is like, yeah, I know that exists and it will happily read and write from this memory, come hell and high water. It's basically encouraging cheating, so yes. how about it? Yes, um, but the nice thing is, Rust forces you again to write unsafe here to tell people uh, I like to live dangerous. So, back to relative performance and surprisingly that is quite a big win for accessing <coughs> that. We are at 2.5 versus 4.5, um, which is nearly half-ish. Yeah. Um, so having that pattern over and over again where you happen to know that you access a certain position in a vector or a certain key in a hash map, you can get around quite a few things. In Rust's defense, in some cases, it manages to do this optimization dynamically when you use the save functions. So as with most evil performance tricks, measure before you cheat because you might already get the performance because Rust is smart. And they do a fair job, but in other places they don't. Then phone a friend, then ask the audience, then document it in a sample, post it on Twitter, and possibly go to a conference for someone to teach you better. Yes. <coughs> um, 
we saw you. Um, last element optimization. This is a bit specific to what we have, but um, since we are doing pipelines and event processing, we often have the situations where we need to give data or send it to multiple things. Um, and doing that in a for loop, since you can't send data that you borrow, we have to clone. If we send this data to three people, we need to give them copies of the data, not the original data. Now, that is true, but for the last element, because the last element, you don't need the data yourself anymore. So if I send this lovely gentleman mails, I can give you a copy, you a copy, and you the original. Um, Defaultly, in Rust, it would be copies for everyone, and I am left with something to do and throw it away. So, we can optimize that. Oh, I forgot the transition. So, you see the solution and the example. The simple thing is, go over all the senders in a queue and clone the message to all of them, slow. Or, go through all but the last one, and then on the last one, don't clone it anymore. <clears throat> and that will work in pretty much any programming language where you have yes. a producer-consumer relationship and you're distributing to multiple uh, participants downstream. So, again, happy crap at around 7.4, I would say. Um, sad crap, there is no sad crap image, otherwise we would have had a sad, sex, sad crap. So, sorry. Um, around 8.8-ish. Uh, so again, not like 10 times faster, but a little, adding all them together would be nice. Last one. Want to say a word about allocators? So, um, you can get a lot of performance benefits in your programming language of preference for free without writing any code. It's really absolutely brilliant. All you have to do is get a Twitter account and monitor what Microsoft Research is doing today. <laughs> we have gained so much from just monitoring Microsoft Research. So, big thanks to half Microsoft. A job. Uh, it's just watching Twitter, it's amazing. Um, so there was a standard allocator in Rust, uh, which we started with originally about 16 months ago on our project. We quickly moved to JE malloc. We got a 100 megabyte per second bump from that in one of our standard benchmarks. We then moved to Me malloc, which came out a few months ago. Um, and that's another 50 megabytes a second, not to be sniffed at. Thank you, we saw last week um, SN malloc, which is being built at Microsoft Research for Project Verona. And they have implemented Rust bindings. I saw it, I looked at Heinz, he looked at me. Benchmarks came back, we looked at each other again, we talked to Microsoft. Everyone is um, happy. And that moves us to 500 megabytes a second. We didn't have to write, well, we had to write a few lines. It's code. two lines. Of two lines. Two lines to swap the allocator. We are getting a 25% boost in performance. And we're working now with Microsoft Research because they were shocked we got that big a performance bunch but they don't know just how much garbage we generate in our application. <laughs> and it's quite significant. Um, so, yeah. as I've said, the projects yeah. that this is um, being applied to is now open source. Please go download us, join in. We have a chat channel, it's mainly weird pictures. If you come to us after the talk, you get stickers. <laughs> so please join in. Um, a reason why we apply a lot of these um, fairly simple but crazy performance optimizations all over our code I'll go through now. So what is Tremor? It's an event processing engine. It's a scripting language. It's a query language, like a structured query language. All of that compiles into a directed acyclic graph, so producer-consumer of nodes within our infrastructure communicating over threads. And we have connectors to and from the outside world. So we receive floods, fire hoses of data from Kafka. We send them to Elasticsearch. Now you have given away what we did replace. I didn't well mention done. the name of the thing we replaced. And other things. Um, where we may have replaced some of those components with things that are interface compatible but running this rather than the original projects that are awesome in every way uh, because we stole a lot of their ideas and we implemented them. Um, so this is the reason why we do it. I'm gonna, uh, time wise, how are we looking? Uh, 15 minutes. 15, okay, we're good. That's so we have two thing. languages in, in Tremor. We have a script language. Uh, it's basically an expression oriented language. Um, and we have a query language which is statement orient oriented. We also smooshed the scripting language into the query language so you can write expressive scripts inside a query context. Or inside the language pipeline is all the way down. Uh, context. Um, we go to the next one? No. Okay, so here's an example of what we do every day. Um, so, for example, we process 10, 11 terabytes plus of logs per day. They're all JSON, so we're slinging JSON across 
our entire production estate globally like you wouldn't it's believe. It's shit in, shit out. I did not want to use that word. Um, so we need to structure, to process, to interpret this data. We need to pattern match over complex, narrowly nested structures. Um, as we're a polyglot environment, we have everything from PHP to Java to JavaScript and God knows what else, probably some Kotlin appearing um, soon. Uh, we need to be able to slice and dice through this data to find interesting subsets to cleanse, normalize, or maybe if it's just uninteresting, throw it to the floor and not pass it on for, um, for systems, uh, for our kind of visualization system. So you can see percent squiggly ARR uh, uh, tilde equals uh, percent um, array percent squiggly. That is, if the event happens to be a record, the record contains an array which is an array which contains one or many records where the field record is present, that's these four characters here, then we extract those records from the array that are in the record into the variable R, and we return the array. You're trying to be terse than Perl. <laughs> but also self-explanatory. So we have hundreds of scripts <laughs> that look like this, where basically if you read the logic, it does take a while to get used to, but structural pattern matching, the ability to um, you know, predict and go through these structures efficiently is our bread and butter, and it's saved um, a lot of our DevOps and SRE people who configure and, and the transformation logic in these systems, it's saved their lives. Um, hasn't it, Anoop? Yeah, yeah. We, we, he was so good at writing these transformation scripts, we stole him, he now works on Tremor. Um, so if you use the Visual Studio Code extension, Anoop wrote, wrote it, say thank you. Um, next? No. Microformat extraction, that wasn't good enough. We have a lot of data types in our production environment, like CIDRs, uh, what else do we have? JSON, um, glob patterns, glob. regular expressions. The problem um, is that in everything is strictly typed in a JSON. So we got to do something about that. So we have this funky little thing that we use inside our funky <coughs> little structural and array pattern matching types where we have a CIDR extractor that will analyze the incoming data bound to the field IP, and if it matches this CIDR, it will extract it and make it available to it and give us the subnet and mask by return, and we can then process that to our system. So those microformats are essentially translated into a workable form that the scripting language can use, and we can then essentially enrich, that, um, enrich our data as we pass it through the system. Uh, next. Okay, Tremor queries. So um, a lot of our bread and butter started as logging. We're now doing a lot of metrics. So we're analyzing data. We're running quartile estimations over things. So we needed a slightly different language for that. Next. Uh, which has support for, for example, aggregate functions. So is anyone uh, here familiar with HDR, High Dynamic Range Histograms? It's a project by Gil Tenna. Um, there's various other parts of it. So this is running a High Dynamic Range Histogram over groups pulled from this group by query, which is a set of event measurements, so this is metrics data, and tags, and for each one of these fields within those tags, that group is applied, and for each one of those groups in memory, we are computing a histogram, which is returning uh, basic statistics plus the median, the 90th percentile, 99th, 999th. If that was a bit quick, come to us afterwards, because that would take- And we can do a deep dive. So these are all structured into a graph, um, so these select statements can be joined together uh, from and into. And a lot of the performance tricks that you've seen where we're sub-optimizing, we're um, passing through the last um, event rather than copying it are required because we're creating these humongous graphs um, at many levels. And every allocation we save has a massive performance difference to us in terms of the overall performance of the system. Uh, we've cheated in other ways. You'll notice a sticker on Heinz's laptop here, uh, the SIMD JSON. We do do data parallel Lemire. processing Dr. of JSON. So, Professor Dr. Mr. Lemire. So Mr. Lemire's work was so awesome, we ported it to Rust. That's also another open source project you can benefit from. And you can talk to us about, especially Heinz, because he um, disappeared for a weekend and it appeared <laughs> in Rust. Um, we have some other conveniences, so for templating, we have string interpolation, so we can quickly create JSON types that are derived from the content. Um, and all of this is now uh, open up on GitHub, and we'd love you to play with it, put it in production, Break and it. give us some feedback. Okay, last, last section. 
Um, ten minutes, perfect. It's S if we had planned that. Um, <coughs> did we? I don't know. I can't um, remember. Architecture specific ones. So you know a bit about what Tremor is and how the languages look and you got confused by select statements, we get confused by select statements. That's okay. So there are some optimizations and some ideas in that which are very specific to that. So let's talk, talk about this simple one. Constant folding. Um, who here knows what constant folding is? Okay, fair bit. I'm proud of you all. Um, I didn't know. I, I called it a combining of variables. And you're like, that's constant folding. What is constant folding? Oh, that is constant folding. So I learned something new. Um, <clears throat> basically, as long as we can, if there are constants in there, we will combine and compute them ahead of time, all the way down to constant functions. Like, we nearly made random a constant function. That turned out badly. Um, we fixed that by now. Don't worry. Random is no longer a constant function. Um, of four, thank you, XKCD. Um, so for records, that is a significant gain because we no longer have to do the logic of creating a record. Um, but for other things too, like help, nearly every function caller, every computation. Um, mutability. Merge and patch are two lot um, yes, a logical uh, constructs in our language, which lets you take a record and either patch it with statements like add a key, remove a key, uh, update a key, change a key, or merge two records into one. Um, TerraScript is a immutable language. We do not allow you to change variables. We just allow you to overwrite them. <coughs> so a pattern we saw scarily often is let some variable equals merge the same variable of key value. Um, so in the naive implementation, this copies S, merges the two things, and then replaces the S with the copy of S with the data. So we're like, hmm, they kind of sucks. Generating a lot of garbage. Yes. Um, and another thing you'll notice is merge and patch are probably not typical features in a programming language. Remember, this is an ETL language designed for streaming, and we process a heck load of JSON. So having patch and merge, which are derived from the RFCs for patch and merge yep. for JSON data or JSON-like nested structures, made perfect sense in our context. And this means that we can write very expressive code that is almost one for one the business logic desired, which um, nice. then turns into something very simple to maintain for the people maintaining that complex, highly variant logic in our production system. To put it in perspective, I think each script has had two to 10 times of let event equals merge or patch event. So on every iteration of a script, we would copy the whole JSON two or ten times, which really is slow, by the way. Um, solution? Well, we cheat, we make it mutable. Um, the interpreter knows that if we replace S with itself, we kind of can cheat and mutate it instead of creating a copy. Works really well, it's really fast compared to the original. You want to say something? Mutable versus immutable code pathways. Um, since the values, uh, the, our data is immutable, um, we take two code paths in the language. A code path which only handles immutable data and returns something, and code paths which update the outer world where we have to be more careful on what we can do, what we can't do, what we change, if we actually have to copy something or overwrite it. Plus Rust comes in and is really smart about, hey, I know there's no change happening in this code path. Awesome, I can optimize it first. So splitting those out is a bit So a lot, of, a lot of our code ends up being used in a streaming context where we're pattern matching. We're trying to detect matching patterns. It's very predicate heavy. Um, there are absolutely no mutations on those paths. It's only once we've detected the subset we're interested in that we actually ever mutate or create new objects. So this made a lot of sense for us as an optimization in the interpreter. In fact, it's good enough that we put off writing a compiler and, and uh, because the interpreter is fast enough, a lot of our overheads so are getting data compiler. in off the wire. Don't, don't say it's fast enough, I want to write a compiler. It's fast <laughs> enough, we don't need to write a compiler. I want to yes. write a compiler. Okay, yes. thank you, I, we yes. can agree on that. Um, and last but not least, JSON-ish optimization, since it is shit in, shit out in the end. Sadly, that is what we are dealing with. It's Cindy Jason, the thing you mentioned before, 
which is about twice as fast at least as the current fastest Rust Jason 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 yeah, library. Jason Jason. No, the fast the, uh, in Rust we have the Rust clone, oh, yeah. and which is slower than Lemire's original one. To be fair, what we allow creating a whole DOM structure instead of just a tape, and Rust has some addition to it um, because it's a little unsafe, but still. Um, we do cheating on hash maps with pre-calculating keys because people keep looking up the same thing in a hash map and if we don't hash, the hash map becomes faster when we store the hash. Um, and half brown, which is a hash map. Um, there is a hash map from Google called hash brown, which is really fast in itself. Um, and but that it wasn't fast enough for you, was it, Heinz? No. no. Um, and then I stole an idea, I think originally I I learned that from Clojure, thank you Clojure, um, where they do hash maps in Clojure at that point in time where only where arrays up to n elements and only after that change to an actual lookup table because like, well, for 10 elements it's faster to just have an array and go through that versus going into hashing and nested structures. So we copied that and made half brown, which is half hash brown. Um, we are bad with naming. Sorry. I thought that name was pretty good. It's good. Okay, and um, last, we are allowed, I think, to mention that we are hiring for someone to work with us on this in open source. Hooray! Um, there is a link here, um, which you all have to memorize. That's part of the <laughs> hiring process. Um, but you also can go to the website, tremor.rs. It's open source, we have a Slack channel, we have a, what else do we have? We have a lot of things. And we're here for the rest of the day, so That's if true, yes. you would like to save on footprint and you use a lot of log metrics processing in production environments, we are here, we can help you. Um, we have another speaker here who's actually using Tremor um, in his organization, so it's moving fast enough, we would love to help. Please reach out and we will do what we can to help you. So, last but not least, Q&A with the graphs of actual real-world um, reduction. This is not the last, but the second last system that went yeah. into production with Tremor. This is the before system. Uh-oh. I rewrote those for the website and it says before and after. We didn't mention the left and Tremor. <coughs> Anyway, um, Lefna was using um, 10 It's the snot gigabytes, badger. 10 terabytes. The snot badger uses 10 terabytes. Um, and we use, I can't say it's 900. Um, Lefna <laughs> uses 2,688 CPUs. Tremor uses 340. And of course, Lefna uses 300 and 300. 300 300? That's too big. 336. 336 hosts where Tremor is using 60. That's more of 6x, 6x rather than 10x. Typically, we're seeing 10x. Uh, that was a very different use case uh, for us. Um, and we have more systems now going, have gone into production since we grabbed that slide. We grabbed that because it was the latest. And then we had a busy week open sourcing. We forgot to update it with the latest lazy happens. Um, so, any questions? Questions? Um, Half Brown is already a library. Cindy Jason and Rust is already a library. You know, I, I was asking about the platform setup. The very first setup we saw is okay, you want to get two keys the table, and then you want to mutate them. Uh, we have a actual GitHub repository that have, has all of them. Um, putting that in a library is really tricky because Except, especially for this one, you need to reason about the data structures. Yeah. And that is something only you can do in your code. Um, otherwise, it would be like, yeah. But there are others we've already put into libraries. If you find something that's yes. worth extracting into a library, Give us a we'd be happy to extract it and put it into a library. So look through the code. If it smells useful and if it smells like it deserves its own logos and diagrams, we will extract it into a library. That's also fine. You mean the borrowed mutable one, right? Yeah. yeah, that is tricky because you really need to reason about the code. Yeah. What we didn't say is that all of our unsaves do come with a decent amount of documentation around them, why we allow it. Unless we forgot that, which we happened in a few places. But we are aiming Only for 73 places. Anything else? Then go have lunch, please. <laughs>